supposed to say yes at that point. Super. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, I'm obviously not getting an introduction today, so. Um, but we'll leave that up to me. I'm talking to you about uh, IDS and IPS testing. Uh, but my name is Aaron Finnan. Some of you may know me as Phoenix. Uh, I'm a researcher for a company called Activity. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me on Twitter or LinkedIn or anything like that, there's the links. Um, if you have any questions and you know ask them during the talk or whatever, if not, drop us an email. I'll get back to you at some point. Um, I'll try anyway. So the sort of stuff that I want to kind of share with you today, uh, sort of the walkaways from today is uh, why test IDS IPS? It's quite obvious because it's part of your infrastructure and it sits on everyone's networks and yet we don't really do anything with it. Uh, I'll make this disclaimer before I start. I'm not a vendor. I don't sell IPS products, so don't expect a sales pitch. Um, okay. I know that's strange when someone talks about IDS. Like, oh, there's a sales pitch coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> what's a good test? But more importantly, what's a bad test? I'm hoping you walk away with that today. What's easy to test and what isn't? Talking about a testing methodology for IPS, IDS, um, or the fact that there isn't actually one, which is a bit sucky, um, and a way forward, um, and what basically the OSNIF project's aims are. So really, when you talk about detection, what you <sighs> before you talk about IDS, you really need to kind of lay out what intrusion detection is and what the clue in that is, is you need to work out as an organization what detection means for them. Um, I'm sure we all know organizations that purchase IPS because they're required to purchase, purchase it. Not very interested in the, de uh, the detection or anything like that. Um, and that's cool. No one's saying that that's wrong. Um, but as an organization, your priorities are different because you're not into detection. You know, detection for you means making sure you're compliant. Um, Personally, I think assessing IPSs is, is, a, is a productive uh, exercise because it kind of matches like expectations and realities, and we always see where that fails. And I'll, I'll, I've got some war stories along the way. I can tell you where they've like IPS have gone into a place and the box owner didn't know how it worked properly, and you get called back 18 months later and they haven't detected anything because it's been configured wrong or didn't understand the technology that they purchased. But, you know, <laughs> you, you, you laugh, but I have so many stories. <laughs> so understanding detection systems. Well, it's when you, want, when you got this and you expected that. Um, you know, it's more fluffy cat than guard dog. Um, but really, basically, you could define intrusion detection. Ultimately, certainly network intrusion detection, because that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about host stuff or anything like that today. Um, but it's basically network infrastructure that monitors the traffic for signs of malicious behavior. Um, NIDS is a passive member of the network, and NIPS is an active member. Though, do you know what I mean? You probably already realize this. Always fall, uh, fails open because it's passive. Um, it doesn't have anything going through it. But think burglar alarms. Or as vendors like to see them, IPS is cash cows. Um, and the reason being is, in Gartner 2010 reported that the standalone IPS market was worth 989 million. That's just on standalone IPS, nearly a billion. Put that into some sort of context, 2010 is the beginning of the, like, the, the financial crisis. Two European countries get build, uh, bailed out in that time. America is having huge financial issues. Uh, and in 2010, companies brought nearly a billion dollars worth of IPS. AC Milan's worth 989 million. <laughs> and of course, in 2010, the Fed brought 989 uh, agency debt, proving one thing that, um, you know, IPS, AC Milan, agency debt, proving one thing that fools and their money are soon separated. Um, and it happens. So, really, when we talk about IDS, it's that box, that flashing box on your network that you can't tell me anything about. You know, how do you know an IDS is working? The light's blinking. Cool. Um, the one that that vendor told you will protect you against everything. You know, those zero days. There was, a, there was a vendor, I think, in Vegas a couple of years ago that had a sign up. It was during, like, Moxie Marlon Spike, let's just break the whole of SSL. Um, and they had on their 
their little sail board that it protected you against all known moxie attacks. So it kind of gives you a rough idea of the vendor speak that they use. But yeah, it's the one that protects you against those zero days and those apps, but it's the one that you can't give me a detection rate for. And an example of how they work is the dead simple. I'm sure that I'm just teaching you how all to suck eggs at this moment, as we would say in the UK, but I'll fly over these slides. If I go over too quickly, stop me and ask me a question, but it's, it's, a bit, it's basic stuff right now. But this is basically how detection works uh, practically. MSO867, because it's not a conference unless MSO867 has made an appearance. Um, but so you look for a, a vulnerability, uh, a worm is looking for a vulnerability, say MSO867, connect to an, uh, an SMB server, the detection system sees this and registers this as an event, looks for the event, sees if there's a threat in there, generates in the alert, da -da, we've saved the internet from the bad guys. That's how it's supposed to work. And the reality is, is their real purpose is to analyze events and respond to them. That's all they do. They're events. It's all about events. And it kind of sounds like magic, but it's far from it. It's basic logic. Basic, whatever IDS you have, or IPS, the bottom line of it is, is that it, it, it's signature-based. No matter what they say, there's a logic gate that says, if bad thing happens here, do this. Right? That has to be expressed in some way, shape, or form. And you can, we can talk about anomaly detection and so on and so forth. But in the end, they're based on something that's called the CIDF, or the Common Intrusion Detection Framework. And these are components that an IPS or IDS should have. This is like 1970-odd that they were releasing this stuff. When you think that the IPS industry, I think 1972 is like the first commercial deployment of an IPS system. So we really suck, and we suck for a long time because we haven't made things any better. But an intrusion, we have four components. An events box, analysis box, a storage box, and a count measures box. We can pretty much work out what's going on here. But even in an, uh, an IDS, say, hey, Phoenix, I thought an IDS was passive. How can it have countermeasures? Sending an alert counts as a countermeasure. Um, and that's, that's the components. And when you're talking about like evading IDS detection, what you're ultimately trying to do is subvert the E box or the A box. Nearly all evasion techniques either try and make sure that an event doesn't happen or if an event does happen, that it doesn't get analyzed as a threat. So in IDS, and when you're trying to evade, you're really trying to get past these two things. You could have attacks here. You know, I suppose there's a legitimate attack by taking the countermeasures box out, so you can't alert the administrator uh, that there's something the matter. But I haven't seen anything practical. So today's first kind of gotcha in that situation is that threats need to be fully understood. Um, and that's a lot easier than said than done, to be honest with you. And threats need to have context. They, mean, they need to mean something. And if you write a simple rule that patches like POC code, I'm sure we've got a few pen testers in the audience and you find a vulnerability in a web app and you go to the client and say, hey, look. And they go, OK. And the developer goes off and he patches the POC code. Go, Yay, retest, we're fine. No. Problem's still there. We'll rewrite our POC code, and yeah, we've got it again. This happens in IDS all the time. Example of this is, I'm picking on something. Um, there's no one in from Sourcefire, is there? Cool. I pick on them quite a bit, and it, 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 it's, not, it, it's not fair, but hey-ho, they are a vendor. They, they, they can handle it. So there is this interesting exploit um, that we ended up making a little paper on called the butthead evasion technique. <laughs> and it's to be taken as seriously as the title, to be honest with you. So this is this old exploit in Snort that has a rule, SID1239. Um, I mean, it's like 12 years old, this rule. I mean, this is mature as anything. And basically, a guy called Rainforest Poppy <laughs> discovered an exploit out in the wild, reverse engineered it, and made RF paralyzer. And he's a, bit of a, he's a bit of a joker, RFP. He, uh, he likes a good giggle. And what he's done is uh, the, the exploit's an old one. It's 2000, and it's a remote, you know, remote DOS attack. You point it at a 98 box, hit return, and boom, shit be gone. Reboot. Remotely, really bad. And basically, this is like a net BIOS vulnerability. And it was discovered that if you had like a null fragment in the source host field, 
chip be bad, we'll reboot, blah, 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 blah. So Rainforest Puppy finds this out in the wild. This is not discovered in a lab. This is discovered out on the bad red side, basically. So he writes this little funny script called RF Paralyzer, and what he does is he sets up a communication session using NetBIOS from Beavis that says, yep, yep, and he puts in the source code of the, the POC, haha, they'll hate me for this, I've hard-coded in the message. So what the, the, the IDS guys thought was a good idea was to start looking for anything, on, uh, anything with a NetBIOS session with the string Beavis and yep, yep. <laughs> Not not the null fragment, yep, yep. All IDS evasions start with this first question. What if I, dot, dot, dot. Well, what if I change it from Beavis to Butthead? Guess what? I've just evaded detection. Ergo, the Butthead evasion technique. But this proving, that there's a better joke in it. It's proving the dangers of character matching. So, you know, they're matching one character, Beavis, against another. Um, and they're using static string analysis. But they have a rule that particularly looks after this vulnerability. Are they protected? Because that exploit was found in the wild. I can guarantee you the original author didn't have a NetBIOS session that said Beavis, yep, yep, I can, I can assure you. And the problem is this complex is complex. I mean, you, you can't get around with it. You, you know, you need, the more complex the threat, the more complex the, the, the signature has to be. It's common sense. Um, but as we all know, vendors like to talk about throughput. They don't like to talk about detection rates. It's throughput, throughput, throughput. How many of you manage a, an IDS system? Three of you. Oh, you're loving the talk. Everyone else is bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone has ever tried to purchase or, or gone through vendor hell, tell me the last time you looked at anything detection related that actually told you detection rates. It's like a little cartel going on. That it's almost like the first rule of the first rule of like IDS is don't talk about detection rates. The second rule of IDS is don't talk about detection rates. It's like the cartel that will they never talk about it. They fight each other on throughput. Oh, we 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 handle ten gig full duplex, and you know we can handle ten thousand simultaneous connections, and blah 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 blah. Great. I'm actually just interested in what you pick up. That's your job. The clues in the name. But the problem with complex is, is that it requires more processing. There is absolutely no way around it. Um, so what that ultimately means is that your throughput becomes a little bit limited. Certainly in like IPS world, because your it, it, it's active member, it's in the middle, it's acting like a gateway almost. So if it requires time to process, that traffic stops while it gets processed. IDS doesn't really have that same issue. Um, and so you'll see like, IDS being deployed in SCADA situations because you don't want a false positive to take the metro system down. Um, you know, we have a, a plant in Dundee in Scotland where I come from, from Michelin. They make car tires there, surprisingly. And uh, it takes them a day to shut the plant down and a day to boot it back up again. So you can imagine those lovely dudes that wrote stupid rules looking for Beavis and blah, 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 blah being in control of your IPS situation that brings down it. So, But long story short, everything takes more processing. And that means time. And that means your throughput is slightly goosed. There's no way around it. And I can tell you some educated guesses at this point. I haven't met an IDS owner that can tell me what their detection rates are. You know, and I've had them for years. You know, I can get them most to tell me what their throughput is. They know this data. Um, you know, probably can't tell me the amount of threats that they actually defend against, but they can well tell me about their false positives because, boy, that pisses them right off. <laughs> I, uh, I did a talk recently on false positive abuse where we were like, uh, I was using false positives in an IPS context to enumerate your rule set. So I put off certain static strings that I knew if you were running like Snort that you would react this way. And if I changed this, you would react that way. And now I know that you're running this rule set with protocol normalization, da 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 So I did a talk about it, and um, the guy was saying, I think you m massively underestimate the issue. I'm like, really? I'm talking about using, I'm talking about being a bad guy with them, and I'm underestimating the situation. He's like, yeah, we deal with 25,000 false positives a day. I was like, how do you manage that? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> But it's purely because the, the, the 
the marketplace when we talk about why people can't talk to me about detection rates but can talk to me about throughput is because the vendors have this whole area sewn up. They own terminology almost. Do you know what I mean? We, we, we're almost like crack addicts. We know that we need to have it. Um, we don't care where it comes from as long as it like feeds the addiction. And that, they, they own that market. We don't, as a community, ask. No one pushes an agenda. And there's some food for thought for the people that are monitoring and managing IDS. That if literally ask yourself, if we fired 100 threats at your box today, you, will you detect 900? Will you detect 99 of them? Will you detect 10 of them? Will you detect 15 of them? These are very simple questions to ask yourself that aren't hard to get an answer to, but give you a rough idea about, holy shit, that's not working the way that I expect it to. Have you guys ever heard of NSS? They're a testing lab, um, and they do an independent test on IPS products. And it's really cool. They get all like the big commercial guys in, and you as an owner go and buy the report off them. And the reason that you do this is it's better to spend three or four grand with like NSS and get their independent testing report than spend a quarter of a million on this shit anomaly detection thing with layer two fall over, blah, 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 and you know nothing about. And NSS testing normally, first time around, first round testing, like how successful do you think an IDS system is normally? Just throw some figures up in the air if you want to. We're all shy, okay. NSS, first round testing, they get detection rates of around 28%. <laughs> so, oh, that's not... Now, I'm, I'm, I'm like advanced troll when it boils down to it. And call me old-fashioned, but the clue's in the name. Out of the, those like 28 of 100 threats, they misdiagnosed 15 of them. Um, so basically, they... Um, they thought it was this threat when it was actually that threat. So if we're being kind of like anal about that situation, that's a false positive. Even though you know, the consequence was right, you thought it was something else, and you're supposed to get that shit right. That's, that's your job. The clue's in the name. You're a detection system. So we can be a, bit, a little bit hard on them and say, well, look, actually, you, uh, you've only got 15%. They bring in a lot, although they bring in their engineers for second round testing, what do you think detection rates go up to? 98%. Which proves that if you stick an engineer that knows what they're doing, these things can like catch shit, and that's their job. And the problem is, is they have very liberal rule sets because of throughput. They tune a lot of stuff out. They scan for a lot of stupid stuff as well. You know, like SMB, when you're not using SMB and all of that malarkey, and you have to go and turn this off and do that. So, yeah, it's important to start. We have this great saying in security, but you, we never apply it to our own shit. Trust but verify. And I think, you know, you, you need to do that with an IDS. And the problem is, doing that now is that none of us actually really have a clue. No offense, but, like, when it comes to, like, hey... We want to get our, we're worried that our protection system isn't awesome, so we want to get a company in to do it. You get a company and uh, they say to you, right, okay, we'll be two days testing, one day reporting, da 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 da. I'm sure anyone that's had some sort of pen test will remember that story quite well. You know, sure, it's two days reporting and not one day and blah 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 blah. But what happens then is that in the end, you're just getting a guy. That some tester, and I'm one of those dudes that get told, hey, you're about to do an IPS assessment. Okay, awesome. Um, what do you want me to do? Oh, they haven't got a clue. You know, you've got clients that say, can you test our IPS? Yeah, what do you want me to test? The IPS. <laughs> I granted, I get that. And picking on the testers there, I mean, you've literally got a dude that's like, right, how do you do IPS testing? Oh, I just get like, do some packet manipulation with Scappy and do this and do that. And yeah, we write a report on it and there's our IDS test. It, it, you know, basically hack a box with Metasploit and if you pick it up, yay, we won. You know, we got root. Okay, that's cool. But all you've really done is just try to bypass detection. And what did you actually learn from that? Hey, an IDS system could be subverted. Who would have known? In other news, water is wet. You know, you don't, you, there is no benefit in that sort of test because 
you know that there's a failure, but hey, you knew that before. That's why you asked the dude to look at it. You didn't think things were good. He came in and he evaded shit, and you're like, yeah, it is bad. And then you're like, how do we fix it? Oh, he, we, we, we don't know. The dude came in, he did some stuff on a computer, and our system was hacked. And the problem is, is the test is not recreatable. And brace yourself, lads, because here's a rant coming, right? The problem with that situation is, is that you need to spend time generating your traffic. You know, people run up onto a network and try and hack a box on a network, and that will tell me if an IPS is effective. And it's not, because it's not recreatable. It's not a scientific test. Scientific tests require it to be recreatable. Getting some dude with his Linux laptop on your network, playing around with like MS0867 and Windows, yeah, cool. But what did you learn from that? Nothing. You learned that your security device is shit. Who would have known? You know, what you need to do is start looking at actually capturing samples in a lab and using those against an IPS. And there's a lot of benefit from doing this. A, it's probably the recognized way of doing stuff with IPS. Rather than getting a sacrificial host on the network and letting some dude hack away, you get a sacrificial host in a lab and collect lots and lots and lots of samples, clean them up and use TCP replay or something, rewrite the packets and run them against the IPS. Surprisingly, people don't do that. And yet it's common sense. Not quite. There may be a vendor that has a, a tool that you can use for evasion technique that likes to be quite loud and well-known in the, in the industry for marketing. And they've released a tool that is a, 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 almost a web application for IPS testing. So you get a VM and another VM and you stick it on the network and you go over the IPS and then you tick boxes and press play. And that is IPS testing, apparently. Really? So we, we just got a web app for that? That, that? That's how we're testing our stuff now? No. Because the problem with that is, is I can't turn around. Who, who runs IDS again? So I can't, I can't like say, hey, have you seen this threat? How does the IPS work? Here's an email. Here's a capture. What do you think? We can't do that because we're not following a recreatable process. And if anyone's ever had one of these IPS audits, you'll know what I'm on about, that it literally is. Like a, like a dude who scratched his head like me and went, yeah, we could test this, and we could test that, you know what would be cool, we'd do this. It's not really, there's, there's no methodology. No, do you know what I mean? It, we have this in web application testing that you build a web app, you want shit to be good, you go off and you go to OWASP and you check it for the top 10, you go through the methodology, you do this, you do that. We don't have that in IDS. We don't have, like people say to me, loved your IDS talk. Uh, okay, there'll be people who have uh, not come to this talk because it's IDS, but there are some people like, yay, I look after it. How do I, how do I test it? Is there like something I can download that walks through it? No, nothing, not a thing. If we wrote five pages today, that would be five pages more. That's that. That's it. You know, it, it's shocking. But what we need to do in testing is just to make sure that we're spending time prepping our test. What's the the, the adage from Abraham Lincoln that if I had is it six hours to cut a tree down? I'd spend the first five hours sharpening the, the axe. We use it for Metasploit or, or Metasploit Unleashed or whatever they say that. In. But he's right. You know, it's better to make sure that your tests are prepped because I can also, with prep tests, contact the vendor and say, "Hey, you see this like threat? We thought we were detected. Like we thought we'd be safe. Didn't work out. Here's a capture. Did we misconfigure, or is there something wrong? You know." It, it enables you to be able to communicate scientifically and effectively. Also means that if you've got multi-sites, multi you can send these stuff off um, and have testers in different locations testing for the set same standardized technique. And as I say, there's some serious advantages. If you have a dude that, that's like hacking Metasploit, let's say, let's say it takes him two or three minutes per exploit, you can only have an X amount of exploits done in any one day. TCP replay, you can play like three, four thousand exploits in like seconds. Done. So that web application test, all of the HTTP evasions can be replayed because someone may have captured them. Uh, and all of those can be replayed in like half a second. And that is Evader, basically. All of its HTTP stuff taken care of. Because it takes time to do it that way. 
And I mean, ultimately what's happening is, is people are just taking a run at it. Yay, IDS, yeah, okay, let's hack the box. Great, but let's do something a little bit better. I mean, once a threat's been detected, I don't think it's too much to ask, and the Common Intrusion Detection Framework states this as well, that once a threat has been detected, it should consistently be detected. Right? That means, like, if you detect it once, you detect it 10 times, 100 times, a million times. It always gets detected. Well, how do you prove that if you've just got a dude with a box doing shit? You can't. Um, there's, a, there's a great product from a, from a Rando. I'm not sure if they still do it, but they, um, they buffer a thousand threats, awesome throughput, right? Buffer a thousand popular threats, right? Um, and then what happens when you think that a new popular threat comes onto the market? See the one at the end? They're like, the straight off the other end. You are no longer protected against that threat. Just, what threat? We're, you're old, we've forgotten about it, it's done now. So with this product, something that's old will always get through. Every single time. Awesome throughput though. <laughs> But the issue in a nutshell is like, we have two problems. A, as an organized, as an industry, we have no kind of universal way of expressing like IPS and IDS testing. No way of us to be able to communicate with each other. Who cares what the vendors say? But as the security guys, we can say, well, you know, product X, if you do this, kind of does detect that. But if you do it that way, da 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 da. We don't like have a common standard language to speak or a body or a framework to work around. And secondly, we, we, we reinvent the wheel. So everyone's experience dies with them rather than us documenting it. So, you know, a company has a decent IPS tester. Company gets good reputation for being a decent IPS testing. Dude moves to another company. Company still has reputation. New company has better reputation, da 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 da. But what he knows goes with him. Game over. That's not a good way of doing things because there's a lot of money involved in this. You know, it sits on our network and, you know, Sony, let's be honest with you, Sony had IPS. You know, best red team capture the flag going. Um, was it low sec 17? Um, but people forget, you know, that the security devices were in play. They, you know, you bet your ass, they had credit card data. PCI requires them to have a detection system. There is no other way around that. They will have had one that didn't detect shit. So here's an idea. Um, the open source network intrusion framework. So don't worry, the clues in the name is open sourced. So what is OSNF is uh, we set up an organization a bit like OWASP uh, with a long-term goal of producing uh, an open source freely available testing methodology. So like we can eventually get to the stage as a community when someone says, hey, is there something that I can download that tells me how to test this? We can as a community say, hey, yeah, there is. So when I started my work, I managed to talk to the company that I work in to s donate a percentage of my time to help get this up and running. And then I went around and spoke to lots of different people involved in IDS testing that I know throughout the industry and said, hey, what do you think about like having an OWASP sort of organization where we could like get a methodology, be a bit public, say, you know what, our members are really happy that you've got great throughput, but we're really interested in what detection you do. Um, you know, do you think as an industry we need that? And everyone universally went, yeah, we do. That's really cool. So at the moment, there's about 25 or 30 of us that are involved in IDS, IPS testing. One of the things that is very clear that OSNF organization should be is a documentation project and nothing else. Um, and what I mean by that is that methodologies should tell you what to test for, not how to do it. You know, not what tool you test for, who cares but that you test for X, Y, and Z. As an organization, people need to, the, the freedom to say, we'll invest X amount of dollars because we don't want you to lose our senior guy while we're doing X, Y, and Z. You know, we'll buy this proprietary tool because it will free some time up. Or an organization might say, we want to better understand that, so we're not going to get a proprietary tool to do it. Much like OWASP. One of the things that OWASP is famous for is the top 10. I bet you can guess what the motivation for the top five is. Um, this is not like OWASP, but it is. This is like a top five things that you should just kind of be aware of with an IPS that you should test for and have a look at. Um, it's not a conclusive methodology by any way, shape, or form, but you know, 
the basic bare minimum standards, and this has been from me discussing with about 25, 30 interested parties. We have a mailing list. You're all welcome to get involved and join and discuss and all of this sort of stuff where we kind of thrash out what sort of things should be tested for. And hopefully the top, ten will, uh, top five will evolve over time with t to, to ten. The, the choice was start with ten and force ten things. And the problem with OWASP is a lot of people say, well, you know, that's not... That's one dude that makes the decision, and it's not a democracy, and blah, 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 blah. And well, I, I just can't fix that problem. But what I can do is start with five that's been built from other people, let the community discuss if it's any good, and let that evolve with time to what it needs to be. Um, I'm going to go through what the top ten, what the top five we've got so far, um, and the things that you should be looking out for on your device or if you're doing some sort of testing. A best practice guide, while I'm speaking to people what they need, um, and a lot of the industry people were saying to me that um, we, need, we need proper documentation about how to deploy this stuff because idiots deploy it wrong. And this is an example of it. So you know PCI? You see that, that thing where it says you need like a detection system, but you see this like encrypted tunnel? You can't break that. So what we see is we see IPS deployed in the middle of two encrypted endpoints with no means of decrypting it because it can't break the tunnel because then it's not PCI compliant. Which means that you can only have it at one point because you don't have control of one of the endpoints, only your endpoint. But hang on a second, at no point is credit card data supposed to be held clear. So you can't, you, you can't, why do they need a detection system? Because they can't check the traffic for signs of malicious behavior. But this, is, this, this situation is funny because I understand why that's happened, but people that own the box don't always understand why that's happened. And I've had conversations that have, we've never had a false positive. Have you ever had a true positive? No, we haven't. That's a pretty good sign that there's something not quite right. Because if you, like, I don't know about you, but uh, IPS, that, that shit false positives all the time. Say, so, hey, look, someone sent a ping and you've given me an alert. Thanks. You know, not having one is a big indicator. So in the top five, we really need to look at misconfiguration. Um, we really need to test for this. This needs to be the... These are not in weight of order in any way, shape, or form. Not like, like this is more important than that or anything like that. But if you're looking at an IPS or you've got an IPS... I know it might be teaching you to suck eggs, but just make sure that it's been configured properly and that you don't have sensors that are pointing at walls and doing nothing and wasting people's time. Um, it, it's just fail, to be honest with you, when you see it that way. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't have it. And literally, encrypted endpoint, encrypted endpoint, IPS, you'd be surprised at how many times I hear this story. When I say regularly, what I mean is about once a week. Right? <laughs> Different sources, different clients. You want to go and speak to like a QSA that goes off and does lots of like, they'll tell you, shit, that'd be another IPS and encrypted endpoint. What, what, what's happened? Why do we keep on making this mistake? So top, top five configuration issues. False positive abuse. This is in our top five. Um, this is something I've pushed, to be honest with you, because I believe that false positive abuse isn't understood, is massively dangerous, and is a very big indicator. False, posit false positives are easy to call false positives because you have no context. And there's plenty of organizations that got a false positive three months ago, and it turned out not to be a false positive, but an actual breach, because they had no context to that attack. But the problem is, is that you, you need to, like, you need to manage it. I mean, false positive abuse is advanced trolling mode. You know, you can just do it to annoy someone. If they find out, they will... Um, they will kill you, I think, to be honest with you, because it is, it's just, it, it's bad. But commercially, we take organizations that are dealing with 25 to 50,000 false positives a day. That's 17 false positives per minute. How do you manage that? But more importantly, what is the cost in managing that? Because if you take your, like, net sysadmin, senior, off to double check stuff, that plan hour is being wasted to your detection system that isn't doing things right. Um, and I don't think many organizations ask themselves commercially, what do we lose by having like 
shit rules. What are we actually dollar sign losing? Because I can guarantee you, you're not making money. You're losing money. And if you manage that situation better, you might have be able to go back to your managers and say, look, we managed this situation better and it saves us 100 grand. Cool. Protocol ambiguities. <sighs> the 90s called, they asked for their flag, frag, and fragmentation attacks. It's shockingly true, but that shit still works. Like, 96 saw a paper come out that, that bore weight to, like, Lib Whisker, which ended up being part of Nikito, and it's got IDS evasion stuff. This is all from a paper in 96 about flag, frag, and fragmentations attack. I mean, they can't have them back because I'm still using them. Right? I don't care if the 90s want them. And the problem is, is if you get an RFC, what you do is you, uh, you look at the RFC, and wherever like, there's a gray area that the RFC has left the implementer to make a decision, so he's left Windows to come up with it, or Linux to come up with it independently, wherever that normally happens, you bet your ass there's an IDS evasion technique there, because those guys, they don't communicate with each other, and you'll have protocols that handle things should be standardized, but not. Uh, and protocol like ambiguity is the main reason for like protocol normalization. It is the the only defense that they have um, in in reality. And literally, find an, if you find if you find like an RFC TCP IP protocol, da 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 da, and uh, you find where it's not quite clear, you will have a you'll evade all the things. Evasion techniques are in there as well. Uh, but how many of you? How many of you could tell me where you could get IDS evasion techniques? Metasploit. Um, Nikito. Uh, all have IDS evasion techniques. Most of the pen testers don't type show evasions. Yeah, if you once you're on a, once you're on like Metasploit, get a, your your exploit set up. If you type show evasions, it will tell you what evasion techniques it supports. Test but verify those. Anyone who's ever heard me talk about this before. Don't trust everything that comes out of Metasploit, okay? Um, you run a capture and you just make sure that it's doing what it's saying it's doing. That's all I'm saying there. But you, you've got lots of places where you can go and get evasion techniques and test your IDS for it. Of course, evasion techniques. Ah, oh, there may be a com let, Let's talk about advanced evasion techniques. Or is that a registered trademark? I don't know. Um, but basically, what you do is you get two really old evasion techniques, put them together, and then you say you've got 164 new advanced evasion techniques, and you sell a product. That's a true story, by the way. Um, for, for months and months and months, it was like, wow, they've got these advanced evasion techniques, and they've got CVEs reserved for them. Um, what, what, what's the story? How do we, what, what's going on? We're not telling anyone because this is responsible disclosure. We don't want you to evade all the things, but we'll release the information later on, and they never did. And later on, we started surmising when we were looking at other people's signature updates and going, these all seem to be DC RPC related. Oh, so what you've done is you've fragmented stuff and used like TCP segmentation on top of that, and now you move that, that's new. That's not new. We've been doing that shit for ages. I mean, Jesus Christ, you can do that with Metasploit. You know, certainly not a 20 grand a license tool. Um, so yeah, that's my, my little pop at them. They did this, like, like I say, it's literally old stuff. Uh, detection rates, of course this has to be in a top five. You know, you, you should be able to, even if it's managing poorly, you should be able to, at the end, at least say, if we had a thousand threats, we're gonna get 50 of them, you know, 50% of them. You know, even if it's like to suck up the pain, it's maybe not such a bad thing. Um, so that, that's in the top, that's in our top five. All of these are open for public debate. This is like what we've termed like our alpha version of a mailing list and a wiki and all of that stuff that I'll give you links for. And if you want to get involved and shoot the shit and argue this stuff out and as an industry, let's fix this problem. Because if we take some ownership as a community and work at trying to get IDS functioning properly, just leave the vendors alone. Let them do their thing. That's cool. Whatever you want to do. If the company wants to make money, fine. We take some ownership and fix it because it's us on the front line. Us that, that needs to justify what we do, not them. <laughs> it's a very, very, very legitimate question to ask a detection system, right? Don't be shy of saying, hey, what do you detect? And it isn't, it isn't particularly difficult to test. 
OSNF is, is, is a good idea for pen testing companies as well, um, because now you have um, now you have an IPS offering. Um, you know, you can go and test for the top five, and at least you can report on something. And the problem with the situation we've got when dudes are just running in it, I write a poor report that says, yeah, your IDS like scored three lemons out of two oranges, and it's awesome. And another guy writes a report and says, yeah, your IPS is round, and it does this, and da-da-da-da-da. There's no joint up thinking. You can't take a report from one company and understand your findings. Um, so by doing this, we, we have a standardized sort of approach. Not, you know, however companies do it, they do it. But if you can turn around and say, how does it factor against the methodology? How does it factor against the top five? Da 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 da. It gives you some context. As an organization, blah, 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 blah. Why do you want to get involved? Well, you know, compliance is a legitimate argument for having an IPS, but it doesn't help you when you get breached. Sony didn't turn around and went, hey, we got IPS. You know, because no one gave a shit. They're all like, haha, Sony, you're bad. So, yeah, you know, having something for compliance reason is cool, but it's not going to save your ass unless you like start working with it as infrastructure. You know, don't forget you're protected against all the ups and all the zero days. Your vendor will well got your back when it goes bad. Now, I'm not saying that you should use OSNF for testing. Um, I am, but I'm not at the same time. However, you go around looking at IDS testing, you know, as either as an engagement or in your own defense. Stop for a moment and don't go, I'm just going to run it um, because that's you've got no value in that, that you've, you've achieved nothing. You may get to pat yourself on the back and say, yeah, I evaded McAfee. Great. You know, but what do we learn from that? And hopefully something like OSNF enables us to share data as well as anything else that we can turn around and, and work with each other. To get involved with us, we have a website, surprisingly, osniff.org. Who would have seen that coming? Um, we've got a Twitter account, OSNF Project. Who would have seen that coming? and wiki and blog posts. Very, very early days. Um, I invite anyone to come along. The mailing list we're using at the moment, sorry, is a Google one. If you're using a um, non-Gmail account, you'll need to drop me an email saying, can you add me? And then you just get like an ordinary mailing list. Um, it's cool. If you are like the person that manages it, get involved, you know, get, you know, if you're doing IPS stuff, get involved, have a chat with us. You might hear some, you know, there's other people, it's, it's almost like, you know, therapy. There's someone else going through the false positive pain too. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little, like group therapy as well. It does, it, it's quite. You realize how cynical we are as a community when you listen to the IDS guys. Um, but yeah, get involved. And if you're a person that manages someone, give them some time off and let them look at this problem. Because trust me, get that shit working. It, it, it may actually help. So question time. Um, Obviously, there's the website details, and I do a security blog where I talk about OSNF regularly at work as well. Um, so yeah, questions. Don't be shy, people. <laughs>